give your story an ending. Even if you're just handing it off to someone else, give it an end. So yeah. that way, like, that's an era that exists for you that, that people can look back at and go there. Come on and visit for any occasion. Don't keep patting down, waiting, comics and conversation. Keep the conversation moving along. Keep reading comics, keep your local store strong. If it's hard, then it's a job for the challenger. Comics and conversation, y'all. From Challengers Comics and Conversation in Chicago, this is Contest of Challengers. And now, here are Patrick Brower and W. Dal Bush. Feast or famine, am I right? Yes. I appreciate you saying that even though you don't know where I'm going. I have no idea where you're going with this. Yeah, I feel a, like a, a there, very are, strange first question. there are episodes where we have a ton of things to talk about. Sure. And then there are episodes where we don't. Sure. Or, or. there are weeks where we, we are crazy busy. Mm-hmm. And then there's two weeks in a row where we're not. I guess you're right. Because of, I don't know, a convention being in town. Mm-hmm. And then the week after because everybody spent their money at a convention in town. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's a thing. That's something that we deal with. Uh, next week is going to be a, a big product week. It really is. There's a lot of stuff coming out, or at least a lot of... Covers coming Items out. <laughs> for one particular thing coming out? Yeah. People seem really excited about Action Comics number 1000. Yeah, we had this talk last night, and we, we've uh, bounced back and forth between we ordered a ton of this book, it's a very expensive book, we have a ton of them, and maybe we don't have enough. Yeah, I with what we ordered, I mean, if we run out, I, I don't feel bad, because there's only so many more we could have ordered, you know? Yeah, and it's, it's a book that has ten covers. Yeah. Nine well, plus a blank cover. Yeah, like, to put it this way... We didn't order 500 copies, but in theory, could we sell 500 copies? Maybe. Maybe. But I, just, I also can't afford to order 500 copies of right. an $8 well, comic book. From a consumer standpoint, if you want all 10 copies, uh-huh. you're spending... What, what is it? How much does this book cost? Uh, it's an $8 comic book. You're spending $80 on this book. Yep, before any sort of discounts or bulk deals, 80 bucks. And you'd only get a discount or a bulk deal if you... Well, I'm assuming in general, not just yeah, for Yeah, oh, us. okay. I see. I see. Yeah, I think it's great that people want a bunch of covers. Sure. I don't know that I would do that, but I might have done it when I was younger. Oh, man, when I was a kid, sure, yeah. I, there were a few comic books that came out from uh, Marvel where they did multiple covers or multiple bags, and I had to have them all, absolutely. And not counting a bogus Deadpool issue, this is the first single-issue comic book series to reach number 1,000. Yeah, organically, yeah. Yeah, and... I mean, not counting, obviously, the weekly action comics, which... But, I mean, counting, because that's in the number. I, I guess, I mean, the numbering is, is legit, but, uh, you know, it's not 1,000 monthly issues. Well, you know we, what I mean? but we didn't say monthly, right? We, did, we, we didn't, said, but, I mean, that's... Yeah. Usually, that's... Since, it, since almost every superhero comic prior to 2015 came out once a month, the idea would be that it would, you know... Yeah. In general... It would it would be a monthly series that reached a thousand, but that's not the case. The irony is that Detective is right behind it, yet yeah. it didn't have that weekly series in the eighties. Yeah. So as it but, is, I think Detective is next year. I think within a year, yeah, yeah, less than a year away. Uh, I've already had people ask what they're going to do for that, and I don't know. Uh, a Batman number one thousand. I don't imagine DC cares. Yeah, that's a, that's I probably mean, it's not a, a thing. It's a smaller character. It's not one that anyone's you know outside of comic nerds are familiar with. So I I don't think they're going to do anything. But yeah. obviously, Dal, the real <laughs> big deal for a Batman book would be Detective Comics one thousand and twenty seven. I guess or twenty seven hundred. Yeah, right. they do that. <laughs> Let's gonna, wait for that. How many years does that? Uh, well, I heard that in twenty nineteen they're going daily. So that would we'll help get, them hit that number. Yep, yeah, we'll get seven issues of Detective Comics a, a week. That would honestly, that would do it real fast, <laughs> man. Yeah. So uh, I haven't. I read. We read the Tom King story in Action Comics One Thousand. It's very good. It's very good. I have to say that already my excitement for Bendis's take on the Superman is kind of waning a little bit. Why is that? I'm really not excited by the design of the new character. The villain. Yeah. I. I, I I, I can't remember I've his name. I've read his name a couple times, and there's a point where I'm like, that's a decent name, but I, I can't remember what it is right it's now. Like but when the story Jaro, starts, but I'm not. sure I'll remember it. Sure. He just looks like a more aggressive Doomsday. He's a big, burly fighter character, and those aren't my favorite 
uh, Superman ones. And, I like the ones that are weirder in their design, the ones that aren't just like can hit Superman harder. Like that's right. that's boring to me. And we don't know anything about the story or the we character. Don't. Maybe he's got cool powers. But traditionally, Kryptonian design does not lean toward massive and bulky. Yeah, I don't 100 percent know what his gimmick is. I don't know that he's Kryptonian or that he's maybe something yeah, else. So it's a lot of speculation on our part. So yeah, and who, I mean, who knows? I, the thing I'm more concerned about, not concerned about, I guess, but as a reader, the thing that I'm, I have a little fear of is how much of what I like about the rebirth Superman is going to be jettisoned because Bendis has his own ideas. Um, obviously, any writer that comes on isn't necessarily beholden to what came before. They can make changes. They can write towards what they want to write. They can create an environment that, that has story ideas they want to pursue. But, you know, I at least to me, I think Bendis has the reputation in Marvel of kind of not caring a lot about what came before on a book he takes over and really sort of gutting it and, and turning it into a Bendis comic book. And there's some fun in that idea for a DC comic book because we've really never seen a, a Bendis DC comic book. But there is that fear of, like, I, I was talking to someone just the other day and they're like, do you think he's going to get rid of Jonathan Kent? And I'm like, I don't think so. He said in a few interviews that he likes what Peter Tomasi and Dan Jurgens did and that, that he's not looking to, to just get rid of all that. But knowing the way Bendis con- constructs a, a superhero comic book, I wouldn't rule it out. I mean, I've already read something about upcoming marital strife, mm-hmm. and I think that's boring. It is. I, that that was um, the, the Superman 2000 plan that uh, Mark Wade, Grant Morrison, Mark Miller, and the guy who did Our Man. Uh, John Arcudi. Yeah. I think John Arcudi was the other guy. They basically had a pitch that was largely dialing back all of the post-crisis changes to Superman, where across a very quick story, they would dissolve the Superman and Lois marriage. They would get rid of her knowledge of, of his secret identity. It was and, called... And it would be a very classic kind of Superman comic. One last day. One more day. Nope. Brand new day. It never got made, but uh, that was that was a pitch even way back in, in the year 2000. Um, and obviously the and the new 52 version of Superman basically did all that, where it was a Superman who had never been married to Lois and had, had never had his identity outed to the public until the very end of his story where it was, and then he was killed. And then replaced and, by the Superman that was married to Lois. Yes, and then also... Right after that, made to never have existed, I guess, technically. I'm, I'm still trying to understand what yeah, happened in Superman sure. Reborn. So, yeah, I'm a little afraid of, of Bendis having too free a hand on the Superman franchise to, to do what he wants with it. Um, I understand the long-time story trope of will they or won't they, and then when they do, it's mm-hmm. boring. But I think it's, once you put them together, I think it's just lazy storytelling to give them problems. I know people in real life have marital problems, and sometimes marriages don't work, and sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't, and then they do again, but, I mean, but that's not what you read a superhero comic we've for. We've got four or five years, a little over four years worth of, of Superman comics, to prove that when you get rid of the marriage, to, to make it a young, single Superman who can date, you don't get any interesting stories out of that. No. It doesn't, it's not more fun or more exciting. It, it's, it's weirder. It's boring. It makes you long for, you know, a, a Superman who has a stable home life and a, a spouse that cares about him and then eventually a child that he can raise. Like, those are all things that are great additions to the Superman pantheon. Like, it doesn't... Superman, to me, isn't a character that you need to, like a, a Spider-Man, kind of view yourself as. He doesn't have to be an, an insert character where right. you're, you know, I, I identify with that character. Superman always, to me, works best as essentially... Uh, Magic Space Dad. Like, his job is to be, you know, the audience insert character it was always Jimmy Olsen. You know, someone who could pal around with Superman, who could hang out with him. And Superman could be the person who could, you know, teach moral lessons and get you out of danger and take you on fun trips and all these sort of, you know, Magic Space Dad things. And it it would bug me if the Bendis version got rid of all of the things that I think have worked really well with the Rebirth version to make a version of Superman that is like the new 52 one where he's kind of a jerk and he doesn't get along with the Justice League and he, you know, is on the outs with Lois and he doesn't have a kid to take care of and all that sort of stuff, which is the best version of that character to me. I don't know. Maybe I'm projecting. This, these are all fears I have. This isn't anything right. that I have any knowledge of. Right. We, we don't know what's happening. Yeah. I mean, we will have... Uh, well, you certainly will have. I don't know if I will have 
will have red action 1000 by the time it's on sale at midnight mm-hmm. uh, that that's Drake right between Tuesday and Wednesday. Yeah, uh, we'll be opening it Tuesday, April seventeenth at eleven fifty nine p.m. So but you have not a minute selling to, the book to go to the racks and grab your copy and get back up to the counter. And by that point, it'll be midnight and you can buy it. Yeah, but we'll see. Uh, also, it's a very long book, so I don't know. It is, but it's it's a, made up of a few different stories. Yeah. So I think like the Bendis one is maybe ten pages. I think. Yeah. The Tom King was was very short. Yeah, great though, man. Oh sure. Yeah. Just like uh, I'm assuming, I have no knowledge of this, but I'm assuming that by Batman issue 100, mm-hmm. most likely Tom King will leave Batman at a point where it's easier for another writer to come in. And if he does indeed get married to Catwoman in Batman number 50, I think that the marriage will be over by 100. Yeah, I'd assume. Um, there was somebody, I can't remember who recently, um, was, was talking about advice I think Grant Morrison gave them. When he was leaving uh, Batman and Robin, his thing was, like, give your story an ending. Like, even if you're just handing it off to someone else, like, give it an end. So yeah. that way, like, that's an era that exists for you that, that people can look back at and go there. So but, I got I got to assume all that stuff is going to get wrapped up one way or another. I mean, that's Tom definitely King. what Dan Slott is doing on Amazing Spider-Man. Yeah. Uh, obviously, we are only as current as anybody else reading the monthly book, but... Uh, I've already read the Free Comic Day book. Yeah, I was going to say, I I did. I read all the Free Comic Day comics I was going to read today. Um, I don't want to talk about them (laughs) specifically until closer to Free Comic Book Day. Okay. But I do want to mention generally, like, reading This Amazing Spider-Man to me Uh is like reading the uh, David McElhenney and Ross Andrew or... Uh, Roger Stern and John Amita Jr. Spider-Man uh, of the day. Yeah, I really dug it. I thought the jokes were funny. Um, it's Nick Spencer's reputation at Marvel took a huge hit because of Secret Empire. So I don't feel undeservedly. Like, I mean, people's your mileage may vary. Um, I didn't think it was as big a deal, but people who feel strongly about it, they have their reasons, and I would not take them away from them. I, I can't tell you that you're wrong to not like a writer for whatever reason you don't want to like him. Or her. But, yeah, so Nick Spencer not getting necessarily a ton of uh, promotion because of this. Uh, a lot of it is, is turned towards uh, Ryan Otley, Cliff Rathburn on art, um, because they are the invincible team for, for a very long stretch of it. Uh, and it's fun to see that sort of style, which Invincible was a very Marvel superhero, superhero book. book. Yeah, it was... The, the premise when it started was the, what if, you know, you, you had one writer on a Marvel comic... And one artist, essentially, past issue, I think, seven. And they just kept going with this story. That Instead of the endless second act of modern superhero comics, if you could progress the story, if, if a character could grow and change, and the things that happened didn't get undone, and that things weren't retconned, and, and it was, you just move forward with it into, you know, 144 issues where it's like, this is a completely different character now. Like, this, this was a whole story, and it got told. This is a human being who grows. Yeah. As human beings do. So, or, I, mean, I guess, half human beings. So, but a lot of it was, you know, Marvel-style characters. Um, Invincible is a very Marvel-style teen hero. So, Ryan Otley, I think, is a great fit for it. I thought Nick Spencer did a great job on the issue. Um, it's both pulling in some kind of classic tropes, where, where Peter mentions something on, like, page two, where he's like, you know, this, this has been a situation I've been in before. Like, this specific setup, this is my life, where, where I, I keep... Moving forward and falling backwards, and that's a very Peter Parker thing to to never quite make progress. As Bruce Springsteen says, "One step up and two steps back." Sure. Um, but the uh, the jokes are funny. I thought the art's fun. It's it, there's some very cool fight scene stuff in the middle, and oh man, I love the last page. Right? Oh man, <laughs> I knew you would. I loved I it. I knew you would. I loved it. Uh, yeah. It's a little bit weird to me to try to reconcile global CEO Peter Parker with. Down on his luck, looking for an apartment with a roommate, Peter Parker. Yeah, I don't think there's ever... Like, in the real world, no matter how bad things get, Mark Zuckerberg is not going to be, like, having a roommate and making, you know, 20 k a year. Like, that's never going to happen. Looking out on the trash terrace. Yes. So, yeah, the idea that, that, like, the CEO of the largest tech company in the world, overnight, is reduced to, like... You know, trying to get roommates together on Craigslist or whatever. Like, that's not... Yeah, it it's it kind of 
beggar's belief. Like, sure, but if you don't necessarily focus on Parker Industries... No. Yeah, I mean, again, it's a very Peter Parker thing for that dude's life to completely fall apart. Like, yeah. he, he's been a, like a Pulitzer Prize winning photographer and a high school science teacher and uh, a protege to Tony Stark and uh, a photographer again, I think. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, the dude's been all over the map. And so, yeah, I... It's fine. I it, it's, um, it's not realistic. It's not world outside sure. your window Marvel, especially considering the Marvel Universe has let Tony Stark utterly lose his entire company and rebuild it multiple times. Multiple times. So the idea that, like, Parker Industries is done. Oh, that Peter Parker. No one's ever going to forgive him. Really? <laughs> For using his technology to, I don't know, kind of save everybody. Yes, but also he made their phones explode, so the end. Yeah. I don't know. Samsung does that, and people still like them. Yeah, they still exist as a company. Yeah. I bought a TV up from them. Yeah, yeah. I thought the Amazing Spider-Man one was good. I thought the Avengers and Cap one was good. Um, I did read every panel of the Infinity recap. Oh golly, why? All it does is just get you up to where Infinity Countdown Prime yeah, was. Into yeah, into Guardians. Well, because I wasn't reading Guardians. Okay. Did it feel like a story you were sad you missed? <laughs> No, but it did fill in some gaps. Okay. I wasn't super thrilled with the way it was told. Yeah. But I did read the entire thing. Yeah, it's unfortunate that the Spider-Man one is just all, you know, primer-style recap of the Guardians of the Galaxy story, while the Avengers one is two different comic book stories by two different creative teams. Uh, I do think that we will focus a little bit more on the free comic day books that are leading into new things. Sure. There's a lot of books that are anthologies. There are a lot of books that are reprints. Strangers in Paradise, which I love, mm -hmm. it's a straight-up reprint of the first issue of the current series, which is only on number two. Yeah. Um, the uh, the first, second one is all excerpts from graphic novels. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a few things like that. Uh, Valiant is, I think, three different excerpts from three different comic books. Um, but there's there's genuinely new material in a bunch of different comics. Um not only the two Marvel ones, but uh, Shadow Roads from Oni. I don't think that's issue. I don't think that'll be a for sale issue. I think that's all new material, and it looks great. It's a really fun. If you ever read Six Gun, it is set it's the sequel to the Six Gun. It, in the world of the Six Gun, <laughs> yes. of the world that was post issue fifty. Yes. Yeah. Transformers Unicron is a is a brand new lead into what will be the conclusion of twelve years of Transformers continuity at IDW. They're ending that that iteration of the Transformers story. So, because this is a, a new push for Transformers... Mm -hmm. Final push. <laughs> and So, because of the final push, mm -hmm. will we not push it? I mean, you love it. I mean, push is a weird... It's. I, I think like... Push, a, push i.e. a couple extra copies for the shelf. Yeah, I think we will. Mostly because it is... Having read it, it is basically the Crisis on Infinite Earths of Transformers. But so, so is people that... people who don't even read the books... Like with Marvel stuff, when Marvel and DC do a big storyline like Metal or like Secret Empire or Civil War, you're inevitably going to get people who are like, or Shattered Grid for, for Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, where okay. they weren't reading the comic, but they heard that this is a huge one where characters die, things are changed forever, and, and this is, um, for Unicron, it is an all bets are off sort of situation, because again, this, this continuity is ending in uh, September or October. When, when Unicron 6 comes out, that's it. So, literally everybody is up for grabs. There's no sense of, like, well, they would never kill this character, even though, like, I, most of the big names have, have died or come back or whatever. Like, it's... it in With page 3, they're like, oh, these characters that you thought were on another planet? Oh, they're dead now. With... So, is this um, part 0 or part 1? It's a 0 issue. Okay. With this Unicron series, mm -hmm. will there still be Lost Light and Optimus Prime? And uh, Lost Light and Optimus Prime are ending their runs alongside Unicron. Okay, but um, they will coexist simultaneously. Yeah, like there's there's a checklist I think in the in the Insider on the back cover where they basically say this is what's coming out each month for the next few months. And certain books like Lost Light and I think Optimus Prime have to go twice monthly to have their stories done by the time Unicron Six comes out because they're they're not. This isn't like when a, a series of times was coming out for, you know, um, Secret Empire or something, where you can come out a little late because whatever. Like, the, the books are still coming out. This is, the line is done. You have until this day 
to get all the issues out you need to finish your story. So it's not a crossover, it's simultaneous um, stories. There are there are certain issues that will tie in. But um, it's not part one no. in Unicron, part two in Optimus Prime, no. part three in Lost Light, there are, part four in there, some other book. There are six issues of Unicron, and then alongside that, Lost Light is ending their 70-issue story. And, but they're out in space doing their own thing. They will probably have things to do with Unicron because you have to have everyone involved. Optimus Prime has been more of the on Earth, on Cybertron, major character sort of story. To to put it in superhero comic book terms, Optimus Prime has been Justice League. Lost Light has been Justice League International. Okay. They're telling different kinds of stories in different ways. So the big stuff happens in Optimus Prime. The the interesting character driven somewhat jokey stuff is in lost light um but everything is it's all hands on deck by the time you hit like months the the last month for for unicron where issues five and six come out everything is going to probably have to dovetail because you have to end all these series and how many different transformers exist across these books uh lost light has essentially a ship worth of people um they don't necessarily all make appearances uh but you have around 100 different cast members you could use from Lost Light. Okay. Um, Optimus Prime currently has... One, Optimus Prime. It does, Optimus Prime. Uh, it probably has about 12 to 18 regular cast members that can show okay. up. Okay, so are we going to assume that IDW is doing black bag versions of all six issues of Unicron with 100 and, say, 25 covers per. That would be amazing. If, if they did an issue of Lost Light where every issue, where, where there were 100 and something different covers for each potential crew member, including some that have been named and never shown on panel, that would be amazing. Uh, <laughs> be also... The wiki would love that because they could have a picture of some of these guys. <laughs> also, not even, but ratio. Yes, like, exactly. Oh, Megatron... Megatron, yeah, it would be like blind box figures where Megatron's like... One in every 12, but, like, Atomizer is, like, one in every 800 or something. And literally every other book you buy is Bumblebee. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Even if he's not in the book, uh huh, he's still going to be on those covers. True. Uh, he has been a, 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 a spectral character that's been appearing throughout uh, John Barber and Marguerite Scott's uh, comic books. And the, the preview pages they've shown of Unicron Zero, he is not dead anymore. So that's the big question leading up to uh, the, the issues that are coming out in April of Optimus Prime. How is he not dead anymore? For a long time, people thought he was just a figment of Starscream's imagination, but then he started knowing things that Starscream doesn't know. So now we're like a ghost, and then it's like how not a ghost anymore? Like, how how is that possible? But I guess we'll all find out in a week or two, I guess. I will say... We'll all find out, Patrick, including you. Well, I'm, I, I'll know before you will, because I'll look at the book first. Okay. I did flip through the Doctor Who Free Comic Day book. Yeah. Because on the cover, mm -hmm. it shows you Doctors 10, 11, and 12. Yes. Inside... There's more. It's... There's less. More Doctors. <laughs> Inside... There's Doctors, um, I don't remember, 10, 7, and 11. Oh, okay. And then... And then on the last page. A single page of 13. And So that's while, the artist who's doing the, the, the 13. Yeah, Doctor it's book. great. I think she, I told you she was good. Yeah, She's yeah. Good. And Jody Rachel, Hauser's writing it. Rachel Stott, real good. Uh, I'm sure it's the first page of the, the new 13th Doctor comic. Probably. But I love that it gets a full credit sequence, including written by Jody Hauser, when it is... The TARDIS materializing <laughs> and the door opening and the doctor coming out. Somebody had to write that down, though. You know? <laughs> I know. It's true. It's, didn't, but, uh, didn't yeah, just no. bring fully for uh, it, head. It looks good, and <laughs> I want us to order, you know, not, not a ton, but to order it for, for the, the shelf. For the 13th Doctor? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But we, We've done that before yeah, when and, they have a brand new Doctor book. And you know by issue four it's going to die. For sure, but that's fine. I, I don't mind selling it for three months. I know, but I, I, just, okay. I want people to get invested. Maybe you won't even be invested. You don't know. I'll read it. I read you, them all br briefly. Yeah, but that's the thing. You, even you stopped. Yeah. You can read them for free, and you're a Doctor Who fan, and you still said, no, it's okay. Well, let's be honest. Uh -huh. Some of them are not very good. It's true. Uh, the difference with the audio adventures, which, as you know, I bought like 50 of them last week, it feels like. Yeah, they they came in on a pallet. Um, I... I we had to rent a van. Yeah, you need a lift truck and everything. Uh, I guess it's worth it, though. I mean, you know, that's a lot of audio. Uh, there were six. Six different series of Doctor Who audio adventures. And, and for the record, I don't routinely buy these. I buy them randomly or mm -hmm. I buy them when 
they team up classic doctors with classic companions. Yeah, or when they do all new stuff like uh, uh, yeah, Professor like, Yana or whatever. I have the War Master. The War Master um, set. I have the War Doctor set. Yeah. Like, expanded universe things with those people. That was John Hurd doing way more of... Uh, John Hurt, not John Hurt. Mm-hmm. John Hurt is also I mean, passed away, but John Hurt, way more in the audio adventures than he did in that one episode he was in. Yeah, I, I mean, it seems like that but, can only be the case. Um, I am a fan of those because <coughs> you get the actors back. You know, it's sure. it's Peter Davison and it is yeah. or David Sylvester Tennant McCoy and it, Tate, or David know? Tennant and Billy Piper. Yeah, those are fun. One of those, a set of those came in. Yeah, so that... Uh, Rose's mom is in one of the ones you just got, I yeah. think. That's fun. There's... Uh, Lady Christina D'Souza has her own series coming out. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's a little bit too far for me. I think the fun thing about all of the, the Doctor Who stuff you get is, since it's it's largely produced and intended for a British audience, um, you'll get, like, six months of it at once, no matter what it is. Yeah. Audio adventures, the metal figurines, in. whatever. Yeah. Like, it's all just like, oh, here's the boat it came in on. There you go. Yep. Yeah, so, I mean, that... And granted, I, I have their voices in my head and read the comics, but it's a little bit different. Mm-hmm. I like the audio adventures. Sure. I don't get to them right away, no. even though I do have enough time in the car with picking up books and whatnot. Uh, I'm, I'm very far behind. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I have them. There's, there's a thing. Uh, I have a, a ton of new Marvel Legends because <laughs> in the last eight days, mm-hmm. in, in eight days, we got three different series. Yeah. I think we talked about it uh, last week's episode from everything we got. But we since did, then yeah. we got the Spider-Man wave, which we thought was going to come before yeah, everything the else. The lizard build-a-figure wave. And then we were told we were getting four different cases of uh, Transformers figures, yeah. and we got two. Which would have been the remainder of, of uh, wave two of Power of the Primes, but instead it was just the Prime Masters and the Voyagers. It was not the Leaders or the Legends. But we were told it was going to be all of them. Which makes me assume that the Leaders and Legends will probably be this week. Well, we could use a week without a massive... Uh, that would be nice. Southern Hobby toy bill. That sure. would be good. We have a, a large invoice this week, and they're just going to keep getting bigger. Yeah. So many weekly books coming out in uh, the next months or so, man. Yeah. May alone is a uh, barrier. It's uh, no justice. And then Man the, of Steel doesn't start until the end. Yeah, it's the last week of May. But then, yeah. It's that. Uh, we also have... Um, uh, your Deadpool, I believe, is weekly yeah. in May. Yeah. At least that's not a huge commitment for us. No. Uh, also, I think every Marvel book, starting with the fresh start, mm-hmm. is uh, weekly. Yeah. That's going to be the case. Uh, did you hear today's announcement for Astonishing X-Men? I did, yeah. Brand new creative team. It's uh, Matthew Rosenberg and Greg Land, as well as an all-new team, team. starting yeah. with issue 13. A weird team, as well. Um, it was. It's an okay team. It's uh, uh, Havoc and Beast, uh, Colossus and Dazzler, um, somebody else, I think. Polaris? Was Polaris on it? I think so. I don't remember. Yeah, it was. A, it's, a, it's an okay lineup. It, it's just Astonishing X-Men has, has consistently felt like the the third place X-Men book and now that X-Men Red's out it's like the fourth place X-Men book and Matthew Rosenberg teased that there's a reason why this team exists and a mission that they have and it's just like I, it, it so rarely feels like that's the case so much as it just feels like I don't know how about four X-Men books uh, X-Men that? Red feels like there's a reason for everybody who's in it <laughs> it, it does yeah and, and I like that team and I like their, their mission Go- yeah. Gold is just the X-Men book Blue is the X-Men book but they're all kids yeah yeah alright uh, I, I do, uh, while I don't necessarily like playing favorites, Red is my favorite. Yeah, I like Red a lot. Uh, mainly for Wolverine and Gabby. Yeah, I, I like the art, I like the, oh, the sure. writing, I like the, I think the direction's interesting. I like that Jean Grey is someone who came back from the dead and looked around and went, man, we gotta have a better solution than this. Yeah. <laughs> These ideas suck, we gotta try something uh, new. But just the, the Gabby and Trinary stuff was pretty great. It was, it was pretty fun. Really enjoy that book. I, I it does... I think it is our, our highest subscribed to X book, but not at what I thought it would be. Yeah, it's it's up there. We pushed it pretty hard. Yeah. Um, I, I still think it's, yeah, it's it's it would be the easiest recommendation for me to make if someone's like, well, it's a good X-Men book, because it just started, and I think it's really good. But yeah, I mean, it's definitely like, it's not leaps and bounds ahead of uh, X-Men Gold sales wise. Speaking of just started and uh, good Domino this week... Yeah, it was a fun book. Really fun book. I, I like what Gail Simone is doing with this. And I like that it's not uh, totally 90s style suggestive artwork. Pervy? 
Uh, I like, yeah, that, that too. I like, despite the Greg Land cover, I, I like that it's a book about female friendships. Yeah. Um, that's interesting, and, and I don't think that gets enough play in superhero narratives. Um, yeah, uh, I, I think the, the Domino character is interesting, and I think the, the setup that Gail Simone has for her um, feels like something you can get a few issues out of, at least. Uh, like a lot of Marvel books, I, I don't know about an ongoing series, but I think you're going to get at least you know one really fun arc out of it. Yeah. That's cool. We'll see. Uh, obviously, if they do a second arc, the art will change, I'm sure. For sure. Uh, it's interesting that uh, David Baldion is, is somebody that I'm familiar with because he did a lot of the books that Parker used to recommend in Parker's picks. Oh, okay. And it's uh, nice to see him doing something, I don't know, I, I, I was going to say for grown-ups, but I don't want to make that sound demeaning to kids' books because obviously they're for grown-ups as yeah. well. Yeah, and I mean, Domino's a book for teens and up, so Man. I mean, not grown-ups, grown-ups, it's still a... Marvel superhero comic. Uh, and speaking of Parker's pick, quick segue, there was a yeah. brand new Parker's pick this week. I heard. After 10 months of not having one, uh-huh. uh, it was done at my request, yep. and it was done at C2E2. So he's not necessarily picking a book. It's more his C2E2 con diary. Mm-hmm. But it's fun because if you look at Parker in the introduction video, uh-huh. and then see Teenage able, Parker. Yeah, able to drive Parker <laughs> uh-huh. uh, at C2E2, yeah. where he's significantly taller with a deeper voice. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was fun. But jumping back to other X books that are new this week, Exiles. Yes. Exiles debuted. Exiles number one. Uh, it's uh, Saladin Ahmed, who did uh, Black Bolt that just wrapped up, uh, is the writer on it. And uh, Javier Rodriguez, who's done some really fun stuff at Marvel. Yeah. Um, he did Spider Woman for a bit, and he did uh, Doctor Strange and the Sorcerer Supreme for a bit. And I think he did Royals for a bit. And don't forget, Saladin Ahmed also does Abbott from Boom. He does, yes. But yeah, I, I enjoyed Exiles number one. It's a slow start. There's a lot of dialogue in it. A lot There's of a lot of exposition. A lot of explaining what Exiles are and why. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the the entire team does not appear in the first issue, which I always, for a team book, feels like is kind of a misstep, even though X-Men Red did the exact yeah. same thing. <laughs> and even though the entire team is on the cover, mm-hmm. the team itself doesn't know who the team is yet. Correct. Or why. They are still getting put together. But um, I have a lot of hope for that book. I thought Black Bolt was a, a real surprise as far as how strong it was and how interesting it, it stayed throughout its entire run. So I, I have every confidence that Exiles number one, while maybe not the best first issue, is part of a story that I think a lot of people will enjoy. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I wish they would let... This is a, a complaint I have with Marvel often, but I wish mm. they'd let the interior artists do the covers. Sure. Nothing against David Marquez, but, you know, let let, let it look like what it's going to look like. Sure, yeah. I, I think it's definitely a drawback for Domino is having a guy like Greg Land do the covers kind of tells you that it's going to be one type of story, and then David Baldion and it's, is doing a different kind of comic. His cover is just her, like, <laughs> her from the shoulders up. Yeah. Hey, it's Domino. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it I don't know what else. It does not tell you what kind of story it is. Yeah. You know, it doesn't give you a, a sense of the tone of the book. Uh, and how weird is his Astonishing X-Men cover where it's the concentric rings of, of havoc coming mm-hmm. out of his chest and just the other X-Men randomly appearing in those rings. Yeah, I, um, Dazzler gets a new look um, for, for Greg Land, and it's a very basic um, Dazzler is a lady with long blonde hair. I wonder if that's going to happen in her one shot. I, I think it's only going to happen in Greg Land stuff because it's probably substantially easier for Greg Land to find Google image search stuff of ladies with long blonde hair than it is with whatever uh, punk design uh, Dazzler is sporting in someone's individual book. Sure. You know, uh, attractive blonde lady for Google search probably gives him so many options. Well, hey man, if you if you look at re- <laughs> wrestling back in the 80s, everybody mm-hmm. had one outfit. But if you look at wrestling now, people change all the time. Sure. And it's like the upcoming Tony Stark book. He's going to have a ton of different armors because people have a ton of different costumes. That's true. More than just the Wasp. Mm-hmm. How big are those Ant-Man and Wasp statues going to be? They're going to be tiny, which in, is great. I, in I that wonder Avengers if they, line? They're going to be like as big as a pop vinyl box, you know? Man. I think. The question is if they just end up including them with somebody else. Uh, what Patrick's talking about is that Kota Bakuya um, just released the concept art for the next wave of Artifacts Plus Avenger statues they're doing. These are based on the comic designs, not based on the movie designs. Um, and the lineup is uh, Vision and Scarlet Witch. Classic Vision and Scarlet Witch. Uh, Captain Marvel and Black Panther. Current Captain Marvel and Black Panther. Um, Sam Wilson, Captain America. Previous Sam Wilson, Captain America. <laughs> uh, Thanos and Ant Man and Wasp, I believe, are yeah, the statues. That's right. Um, and they're all they're they're all based on one specific scale. They're one tenth scale so however big that character would be in real life they are a tenth that size for the statue so, so Thanos is going to be gigantic 
And but, Ant-Man and Wasp are tiny. Yeah, so they're the shrunk down Ant-Man and Wasp. But I mean, like, if they're really one-tenth scale, around. they have to be the size of an ant. Well, they can be, I mean, maybe the ant's a, a bigger ant. I don't know. So the question is if, if those two maybe get included with Thanos or with um, Captain America or, or with... somebody else. Yeah, if, if they're bundled in with something. Because in general, Kota Bakuya does not like doing... Uh, statue boxes that cost less than 60 bucks. Sure. Um, like they were uh, the the X-Men 92 ones they've been doing uh, or they've been promoting they're doing them as two packs because individually there's so little to them paint and sculpt wise and they don't come with bases that they would be like 30 bucks and they're not going to do 30 bucks statues so you get two for $75 or whatever. So is that line going to continue because they don't seem to... <clears throat> Which line? Uh, the, the, the X-Men animated... Yeah, I mean, they've got four statues planned. Two, but, I mean, do you think packs. they're going to keep going after that? Because... Potentially. They're because also... they just announced the Avengers line, and they don't usually... Oh, they, they, they have a lot of stuff going simultaneously. They'll have um, the DC stuff going, they'll have... Right, but, I mean, they don't usually have two lines of the same... Well, DC, they're, they're doing the DC comic book line, they're also doing a Batman animated line. Okay. Um, they're doing the Marvel uh, comic book line and the X-Men 92 line, and they're still doing movie statues when applicable for both those brands yeah they, they've got a lot of different simultaneously running lines um that said like for the comic book ones like the avengers ones won't start coming out until the defender ones are done they're not going to run those simultaneously that's what i meant okay yeah but like something that, that's not the same aesthetic or not by the same um designer or sculptor they'll they'll do those i don't know if i'm going to get the batman anime ones probably not but you'll get the avengers definitely getting the avengers yeah but you're not getting an X-Men animated? Yeah, but I don't think so. Some of it's just running out of room. I yeah, mean, there's I only mean, so many more I can get. That's um, true. So, so a whole, two, essentially two whole new lines I can't do. Same way I don't do the movie ones because A, I'd be so far behind, but B, I, I don't need an addition. Like, it's, it's fun sometimes to have a month where one doesn't come out. Those right. are nice. Also, I'm telling you right now, <laughs> you can't have that space up there. I was looking at the shelves I have right now, and I had to move some stuff around today to accommodate... Uh, the uh, Robin and Ace, the Bat Hound statue, and the Catwoman statue, and realizing, like, okay, well, you know, where are these going? W- what is the next phase of this? If I have, you know, seven more Avenger statues and four more Defender statues, five, I think, because there's two Daredevils. Um, so it's figuring out, okay, can we do different layers? Can we do these here and these up here? So I'm already looking at the space I have and figuring out what I can do with it instead of needing more space. Uh, all right, so since last week was all about the Diamond Retailer Summit and mm-hmm. C2E2. Uh-huh. We didn't get a chance to talk about the announcements that had happened Comic at the same time. Yes. And I feel like I've forgotten most of them, but I believe the biggest one was the Return of the Fantastic Four. Had we not talked about this yet? We I don't think talked about that, but I don't know that I would consider that the biggest one. Um, but we'll talk about Fantastic Four first. Okay. Uh, Dan Slott, Sarah Pichelli. I think we. I feel like we might have talked about this. Okay. Then we'll skip over it. Yeah, I, I think it'll be good. Um, I don't expect Sarah Pichelli to be on it very long because it's a Marvel book. But so I we assume... already know that from from <laughs> the mouth of Jason Aaron personally, yeah. we know that Avengers is going to be like a story arc and then a flashback to the Avengers 1 million BC mm-hmm. issue or two and then back to a new story and um, to give Ed McGinnis time or whoever else comes on. Yeah. But we know that uh, not only does Sarah Pichelli do the Free Comic Day Avengers book, yes. she's doing the first flashback. Um, I don't think... I... I don't like, think it was a flashback one. I think they mentioned that the one that she's doing is more of like a hit, hitting around the Marvel Universe. Like, Okay, but the the first single... single yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the first side story thing she's going to be doing. I think 7 and 8 is what she's doing. Yeah. Yeah, I, to me the biggest news for the weekend was uh, Catwoman, Joelle Jones. Oh, sure. Yeah. That seems like yeah. a pretty big deal. Well, it's, I meant for Marvel. Oh, okay. Sorry. It seems super smart of DC to, to launch Catwoman on the same day as the Batman wedding issue. Um, I gotta assume most people who are buying one will buy the other. And a lot of people are going to be buying Batman 50. Oh, yeah. That's also cap number one that day. Yeah, July 4th weekend. So I'm May. worried about... Uh, not I'm, weekend, middle of the week, yeah, isn't it? I'm wor- well, yeah. It's a Wednesday, it's, yeah. It's, it's literally July 4th, yeah. but that's the problem. It's like, who's going to be around to buy comic books on 4th of July? So, <laughs> hypothetically... Yes. And this is completely hypothetical. This mm-hmm. is not based in reality. I'll stay open until 7 Hi- that day. Hypothetically, <laughs> if we were... <clears throat> pardon me. If we were able to get Ta-Nehisi Coates... Uh-huh. To sign Captain America number one. Sure. When would you want to do it? Obviously, I mean, I would defer to his schedule, but if we had a choice... Yeah. With a book that big, uh-huh. I feel that if we don't do it on July 4th... Right. 
the number of people that show up will be bringing the book that they brought from somewhere they bought from well, somewhere else. The, I mean, we could make it where you have to buy a copy of the book. I mean, that we don't enforce that a lot, but if we had right. someone like that, we would say you have to buy a copy of the book. But that might just mean okay. people say, "I don't show up." Fine. If you don't think it's worth five dollars to meet Tana Hesse Coates and get him to sign okay. your copy of Captain America and maybe a book you brought from home, one other item, then I can't do anything about that. If you don't think it's worth five bucks, that's on you. And assuming we would be paying to fly him in because he's right. not local. Right. So what would your pick be? It, it's tricky because I, I think he's a big enough name where I think you could maybe make a case that, that if we had him, people would find a way to be there. Okay. Um, the, the thing that makes it difficult to pick another day is I don't know what the, the holiday weekend is going to look like. I don't know when fireworks are going to be versus like when people are taking off of work or yeah, whatever. See, it's the middle of the week. People will have that day off, but right. I don't think anyone's going out of town because it's the middle of the week. Right. So, I mean, if people are going out of town, are they going out of town up through July 4th or starting July 4th through that weekend? I, I don't so know almost, that that many people go out of town for July 4th anymore. I mean, if you're having the middle of the week off and you've got Saturday and Sunday off, a lot of people will just take Thursday and Friday off because they're like, well, then I can have five days off to go on vacation to take my family somewhere. Or alternate Monday, Tuesday, to yeah. To do whatever. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know where people's travel schedule is going to be. So, if honestly, if I had a choice, I might push it um, until the next week. Either um, July 11th or the 13th or that weekend or whatever. Like, But, obviously, July 4th would be great. I mean, it's the but day the book comes also, out, it's 4th of July. If it wasn't July 4th during the day... If it was July 4th during the day, mm -hmm. I assume hot dogs. Sure. But if not, would you want to do a daytime signing or an evening event? Like, what do you think is better for... I would like to do... I mean, with someone like that, I'd love to have, like, a signing and a talk. Yeah. You know? I mean, we rarely do that, but we rarely would have someone who is you know, a genius grant recipient, like, well, who, who a okay. lot of people have a lot of questions about, you are writing Captain America, you are someone who is critical of America as it stands and, and kind of historically, so what is the deal? <laughs> uh, I completely understand, that's a little too specific for this hypothetical. Uh-huh. No, but I just mean, like, um, I, I'm not saying these specific questions, but I mean, a, a right. discussion or some sort of ability for him to, to kind of you know talk to the audience or whatever I don't, we don't have space for that is the okay. problem alternately uh -huh. what if it was Lionel Yu uh, and not Tan Hesse Coates okay I think that'd be fine he's a popular artist but I mean that would take away the speech component right oh yeah yeah I mean it's we usually don't have artists give, I mean we could I mean I wouldn't be against it and certainly it'd be easier to navigate than you know trying to fit Fans for Tana Hesse Coach sure. into psych or uh, whatever. And I, don't know and I reiterate, means. not only is this hypothetical, Beyond hypothetical, we are categorically not having Tana Hesse Coates or Lionel Hugh. Unless they're listening to this in, podcast, <laughs> and if you are, get in touch. We'd yeah, love sure, to have you out. Sure. Yeah, I'm not saying we're against it, but no. what I'm saying is not only do we have no plans, we have not started any discussions. Yeah, I, I would, we wouldn't even know where to start. Yeah. This is just me spitballing some things with you sure. using that as a. Yeah, do, doing stuff on a holiday, uh, real tricky. I mean, on the one hand, people got the day off, so maybe they're more likely to come out. On the other hand, maybe they have the day off and they're busy doing stuff with their family But or alternately, maybe travel's more expensive because it's a holiday. For sure. I mean, hotels definitely would be. Yeah. 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 That's right. Uh, we will we will um, see if we can't uh, evict the tenants below the studio and see if we <laughs> sure. if Don Hesse and Lionel Francis just can't stay <laughs> sure. here together. Sure. Something like that. Uh, yeah, anyway, uh, Catwoman number one, mm -hmm. uh, that looks, uh, wonderful. I assume it's gonna be monthly and not bi-weekly. Yeah, it's gotta and, be monthly. And I assume it's Joel even, Jones writing and drawing it at least to start. Even with that, I assume there's gonna have to be other artists helping out. For sure. But that's a, an amazing idea and will sell a ton. Yeah, definitely. The only other couple things that I think are, are maybe worth mentioning, not necessarily discussing, uh, in comics news are, uh, some editorial changes. Uh, Joe Illich is now an executive editor at Valiant. He came uh, from Lion Forge. Yep. In um, fact, wasn't he just at the uh, the retailer summit for Lion Forge? I believe so, but I don't remember for sure. That that weekend's a bit of a blur. Uh, and then the other thing is uh, Chris Ryle. Chris Ryle is now uh, in 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 a yet to be defined position at Skybound, uh, formerly the editor in chief at IDW for a number of years. For uh, fourteen years, he was at with IDW, not necessarily editor in chief that whole time, but. Been with the uh, company for very long. Yeah, time. and Chris Ryle has uh, did a signing with us. 
uh, specifically for a, a book he he wrote. And then if you bought the we book, we still have, I think, yeah, mm-hmm. hundred um, books for libraries or most essential graphic novels, something he co-wrote it. And uh, what was unique about his event was if you bought the book, you got two minutes to pitch him on a uh-huh. book Friday W. He did not make any purchases uh, at from those pitches. Just, no, but it was still uh, it was still fun to see sure, it happen. Sure. Uh, yeah, I think that he'll he's a good fit for those guys. Um, I I was telling you this before when we talked about this yesterday. I personally believe that that may have been on the table before he left IDW. Yeah, I'd be shocked if it wasn't. Uh, although, I wouldn't be surprised to find out if he just said, hey, I need a break, and as soon as he was free, uh, so, uh, other, uh, I'm assuming several publishers mm-hmm. like, hey, buddy. Because uh, the way, when he exited, he made it sound like, I'll probably be back in comics, but I don't know for sure. Yeah. But, I mean, how many times do wrestlers leave a company saying, hey, I'm, uh, I'm going to look at my options outside of wrestling, only to debut at a, a different brand? the exact like the next week or as soon as their non-compete clause is is up but yeah i think that's a i think he's a good fit for that and i'm interested in what that means for uh sean mankowitz's role yeah again they they haven't given chris ryle a title yet so i mean what his responsibilities are and and where he fits into the current editorial structure we don't know yet uh we still don't know those four idw (laughs) announcements i I mean i I don't i don't think either you or i have bothered to go out of the way to uh i mean the, the sites look. that i normally follow for comic book news like um the beat or icv2 or cbr no one reported <clears throat> anything on any new idw stuff or at least nothing that you know um bubbled up for me well there has been a little bit of follow-up on last week's i guess now the last six weeks mm-hmm. hot button issue for comics retail yep and that would be, of course, Comixology selling all of Marvel's trades, new trades for the week for 99 cents of a, a digital mm-hmm. copy, a digital download. And it, it happened again this week. And several retailers have written open letters within the comic book industry. And we referenced Brian Hibbs' last week, right? Mm-hmm. Well, then there were people on the opposite side basically going after Hibbs for doing that and saying, uh, Marvel said they don't know, get off their back, what's wrong with you? We talked about how there was a publisher that we talked to that said, that's not how a comicsology works. And then The Beat put out two or so different articles Mm -hmm. about um, maybe this is how the contract they signed, who knows? Yeah. And and then retailers point to that saying, see, see? Which again, no one really knows. Marvel has said, this isn't us. Amazon and Comixology have said absolutely nothing. So, mm. but what is the situation in the last couple days that Amazon has stopped? Comixology has Com- stopped doing their, okay. their ninety nine cent sales, but Amazon still is. That's weird. Yeah, which which lended a little bit more credibility to the argument that this is Amazon's doing, not necessarily Marvel or Comixology. It just seems weird that if it is the case that Marvel didn't have any protections in place against this, Mm -hmm. that they wouldn't. I mean, ultimately, they're a separate company than Disney. I mean, they're not... Disney executives don't go over every talent contract or uh, sit in every editorial meeting, I don't think. I wouldn't assume, yeah. But it still seems like a, a big mistake to make. However, I mean, look. We just celebrated 10 years of business. We've mm-hmm. made plenty of mistakes. Sure. And while we don't necessarily call them out and say, hey, look, everybody, look at this mistake, mm-hmm. we own up to them. Sure. If they're brought up, we'll be like, yeah, we did that. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're not going to shine a light on them ourselves. Sure. But if people come asking us. I've, I've been personally yelled at by Chip Mosier from Comixology. <laughs> yeah, that was great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Fun, fun times. Um. So, in the last couple of days, we've gotten a couple of more, um, not necessarily just Google reviews, or reviews on Google, mm-hmm. uh, or like photos added, but every time I get a notification about some activity, uh-huh. I assume it's going to be a negative review <laughs> from uh, a gentleman who wanted uh, oh, yes. drawer boxes. Yes, he did. Yeah. Uh, and who, long story short... Didn't seem to understand the concept of posted hours. A, a guy called asking about drawer boxes and then said, "This is the, the and later in the day Wednesday, and said I can't make it there by seven. 
uh, he was rather specific, right? He said, I can be there by 7.08. Yeah, so th- this isn't the short version. This is the whole version. Uh, okay. we, we got a phone call uh, late in the day on Wednesday. It was like 6.53 or 54. We closed at 7 o'clock on Wednesday. Uh, this guy calls up, uh, do you have drawer boxes? Uh, we do, yes. Uh, we had one left at the time. Okay, great. I'm, g- I'm going to be there, uh, but uh, I, I just I don't think I can get there. You, when, when do you close? 7. Yeah, I don't think I can get there at 7. Is there any way you can stay open until, like... I like eight minutes after. I'm like, I can't. We're we're closing at seven. We've got things to do after the store closes. We're closing at seven. I'm sorry. And it's true. We did have things that we did yeah. last night. Yeah. And I'm also, like, this is the end of a long stretch of you being sick. Yeah. And it's just a matter of like, I, no. I mean, we're open till seven. Occasionally, there are times where I can I can do that. And if if you ask me and I can do it, I'll say yes, I can. And if someone's in the store and I don't have anything to do after work necessarily. I'll let them hang out and take their time, and I'm not going to rush them out of the store at 5 or 7 whenever we close. But this time, it's like, no, we got to go. So it's like, no, we're, we're going to be closing at 7. If you can't make it by 7, we're going to be closed. Okay, okay. Guy hangs up. So sure enough, 7 o'clock, we close. We flip the lights. We flip the signs. We lock the doors. We're counting down the drawers. So the drawer is closed. Like, we've we've zed out for the, the day. The doors are locked. The lights are off. Yeah, and again, drawers being counted down. Done for the day start hearing someone pulling on the door and it's it's a guy and he's shouting drawer boxes question mark at the end so and, uh, clearly it's the guy because it's 707 708 which again i told him we would be close at seven so don't don't i can't we're not staying open late but because he saw people inside he's pulling on the door i'm like we're, we're closed uh, and and i can hear him oh come on i i I just need, I, I, real quick, real, and I'm just like, I, I'm counting down the drawer. We are closed. Like that guy who wanted the Falcon who's like, pulls, shows out yeah. a wad of bills. I have money. Yeah. Dr- count, counting down the drawer, closed for the day. And and he gets this kind of angry look on his face, and he goes, are you the owner? One of the owners? And he gets this angrier look on his face, and then he just kind of stomps off. I fully expected that it was going to be a case of he thought you were... Just someone who worked there, then yeah. he was going to call and tell on yeah, you. Yeah, I can, I can report you to the manager. Go, you, you can report me to myself. Go ahead. I mean, again, posted hours, doors are locked, lights are off, counting down the drawer. Like, could not be more closed. The only way would be if we were physically not in the space anymore. But that that was the only part of it we, we didn't do. Yeah, yeah. Everything else was closed. But I fully expect a, a negative review somewhere. Yeah, which... I mean, Wait, I, I mean, I, fine. I told you, like, when you said, like, oh, he's going to do, like, a one star, I'm like, I, fine, I would love to, you can respond to those online. I would love to respond and tell that exact story. Like, sure. I, we were closed, and you called and asked me to stay open, and I told you that was not going to happen, that we were closing at 7. There was no mistake. You just thought, because you showed up there, that I would be like, fine, and I'd give in. Like, it's too late. It's not happening. Yeah, so that was fun. Uh, Dal, as you are aware, uh, this is Contest of Challengers, a comics industry business podcast on the Yak Channel Podcast Network here in Chicago. And we've been doing this podcast since August of 2009. Golly. So there's 300 and, I don't know, I think it says 367, but that's wrong. I think it's uh, 337. 337 episodes uh, that we've done so far. So if you're new to the podcast and you want to take a little trip down memory lane or, or in fact, a flashback to see what comics retail was like in like 2010 what we got wrong in 2011 <laughs> <Yeah>. right. <laughs> those aforementioned mistakes uh-huh. trying to hear about some of those uh feel free to, to listen to some old episodes we and recorded if you them all. we did we did indeed and we even put them out there if you listen to uh-huh. uh and if you like this podcast perhaps you want to uh tell itunes that you like it perhaps you want to subscribe to it or perhaps you want to uh support us on patreon for this very podcast and even though we did the $5 level shout-outs uh, last week's episode. Mm-hmm. Since then, we have Robert Lane, who is now also a Patreon. Thanks. So, or a patron. Patreon patron. Well, he's a Contest of Challengers patron on Patreon. Correct. I anyway. Think that, that would be the appropriate phrasing. Thanks, thanks, Robert. Thanks, Robert. And one of the things about this podcast <coughs> is, maybe not so much this episode, but sometimes we get pretty deep into into the weeds, into the minutia of, of the, the business the and esoterica. stuff. The esoterica. And I understand that the guys from Pittsburgh Comics Podcast talked about us this week, so I know we've got some new ears as a result of that. Neat. Thanks, guys. But being surrounded by comics and having comics be a major facet of our lives for so long, mm-hmm. 
sometimes we don't necessarily see how things are looked at from someone else's eyes. And I'm going to end this week with a, a story from my sister Karen, who is a preschool teacher. Mm-hmm. Routinely, the kids will be wearing superhero t-shirts or costumes because it's preschool, or they're doing superhero-related things. So she'll always send me pictures or uh, tell me stories about it. Mm-hmm. But this week, some of the boys got together and built a bat cave <laughs> okay. in, in class. And all they, they wanted the bat signal. Mm-hmm. They wanted the Batman insignia sure. on to put on the outside of their cave, and, and there's preschoolers, and it can't necessarily draw it. So they asked my sister to draw it for them, mm-hmm. and she did. But if if anyone asks you or me to draw the bat symbol, mm-hmm. I mean, first of all, I'd be like, "What era?" <laughs> but that's why people don't ask you. <laughs> yeah. She drew one, and they cut it out and put it on, and uh, it's adorable, and it is. Almost unrecognizable as the Batman logo. Okay. But I'm sure the kids loved it. Sure. And uh, I'm going to use the picture of it as the uh, icon for this week's episode. Cool. I kind of kind of did it on the uh, the whiteboard, but okay. that's actually a little bit too bat-like. Sure. Based on what you did. I love it. I think it's such an amazing picture. And I think that it's such a weird thing to have... Something that's so ingrained and so yeah, I've said common. It, I've said it for a while. I think kids come out of the womb knowing Batman. Yeah. Like, it seems like there's not a point where kids learn about Batman. They just sort of know it. Like, once they can talk, they can start talking about Batman. One of the harder insignias to draw is the Superman S. It is. And I can do it easy, but I've done it's, it for years. It's just two fishes. It's the John Byrne two fishes. <laughs> yeah. It's the negative space two fishes that John yeah. Byrne draws. But I, I love the fact that... While so like non comic fans, they all know Batman and Spider Man and Superman. But when you have to dig into a specific part of it, it's like, oh, I don't actually know what this is. Mm-hmm. And it's a thing that is so immediate for us. Sure, is so foreign to others. And uh, I just I love that story. And I love her interpretation. Yeah, because like she could have just pulled out her phone and looked it up. Nope. She's like, no, I can do this. Yep. And she did it. Sort of. And. Like, I didn't look at it and go, what is that? I just went, thought, that's adorable. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, what else is adorable is all the events we have stacked up so many. in the coming weeks. And, for example, this, this upcoming week, we have two right away. The aforementioned midnight-ish release for Action Comics 1000. Yep. And then on Saturday, which would be the 21st, we have the release party for Speculative Relationships Volume 3, the third and final anthology graphic novel about sci-fi and romance combined. And not only is this the first time we'll, we'll have Volume 3, all three volumes will be available, and we'll have a slew of creators from all three volumes at the store, hanging out from like 5 to 9. Uh, there'll be cheap beer, there'll be snacks, and a ton of local artists. Cool. And I think it'll be fun because we've done the release parties for volumes one and volumes two. Yep. We kind of have to do this one, you we know? We have to, it's, legally. It's, uh, it's built into our corporate identity, mm-hmm. I guess. Yeah. We could be sued. Right. We have. No. Uh, we're excited for that. The following Saturday is Michael Marici coming back and doing a Saturday signing yeah. for Wasted Space number one, which actually comes out this week, but we're getting him... After the book's been out for a little bit, so people had a chance to read it and talk yeah, about it. And, exactly. Uh, we had a gentleman in today who was very excited for the event and asking about a bunch of other Marici books. Cool. And uh, Yeah, I think that this will be a lot of fun. And, and while we did have Michael in a few weeks ago for his writer's workshop, mm-hmm. um, it's great to see a local creator who's willing to make the rounds for their books. And yeah. he's a guy that, like, this, this book's come out from Vault, and mm-hmm. he said it's one of the most fun projects he's ever worked on that's great and i love that he's just like constantly prose and writing screenplays and comics but for all the publishers as well yeah he's also got like the <clears throat> pardon me the next nightwing he re- he wrote oh cool so the guy is always always busy and then on monday the 30th the last event for april yep. of 2018 is our book party for beautiful darkness which yeah. is a book that is both beautiful and and very dark. It's true. And it is uh, just wonderful and available at 20% off cover from now until that day. Yep. And then, of course, I mean, of course, May 5th, 
free comic book day, not only will we have thousands of free comics, yep. not only will we have a bunch of cosplayers, mm-hmm. maybe more than we've ever had. Possibly. Not only will, weather providing, <laughs> we have some pretty great photo opportunities. Yep. Not only will we have Steve Lieber from The Fix and Superior Foes of Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. Not only will we have Ryan Brown from God Hates Astronauts, Curse Words, and Blast Furnace. We've also just added Max Bear from Scally Ho and from the C2E2 Revolution Brewing team-up comic that I don't know what it's called. Galaxy Hero? Galaxy Hero. Thanks. That's the one. You're welcome. So Max will be there as well. So we'll have three great creators. And we will also have a 50% off Archie sale on a ton of Archie collections. Yeah, one day only. That is just for free comic book day, and it's a thing that uh, we are doing in conjunction with Archie just to make this day even more special. Yeah, that's great. Which, I mean, you're already going to have, well, you and I, Uh uh, almost a full cast. I can't work that day, by the way. That's fine. Okay, You're not the only one. Almost a full cast of... (laughs) current challengers Uh we'll have some past challengers coming back at least three four cool four Four. that'll be on hand golly and uh free books that we started talking about at the beginning of this episode and oh boy does that bring us full circle except we're not done we've got a couple more announcements oh my god we have an event that we don't have a date for but it's going to be amazing. Cool. It is for the Oni graphic novel spectacle yeah that's right Megan Rose Gedris uh, ironically, I got an email today from someone at Oni saying, "Hey, we got this book coming out with a creator in your town." <laughs> I'm like, yeah, we're uh, yes, that would be great. We're Thank on you. it. We're on it. Uh, but um, Megan Rose Gedris has uh, some very talented and creative friends who will be at this event <clears throat> and performing at different parts of the night, Neat. doing all sorts of things that we can't even get into. Uh, again, we don't have a date for that. It's probably the 24th, 25th, 26th. I don't remember the calendar, but either the last Friday or last Saturday uh, in in May. Uh, immediately after that, Saturday, June 2nd, we have a pretty big deal event with for Adventure Time and for the Here Initiative, celebrating the Here Initiative's graphic novel collection, well, uh, art book collection of uh, 100 covers that they've had done, that they have artists do covers for, for Adventure Time. Blank covers, artists drew on, they put it in a graphic novel to uh, raise money for the Hero Initiative. And we're going to have um, a, several of uh, the artists in the book on hand. We will have hard covers, we will have soft covers, and Jeffrey Brown will be doing a bunch of uh, sketch covers in advance to uh, raise money all for the Hero Initiative. Cool. Uh, it'll be a, a, a good time, a lot of people... And then I get to see Taylor Swift later that night. Yay! Uh, And also, one more event in June that we don't know when, but it will be fun, and it features somebody that we've already named during this podcast, but I won't say who because it's not carved in stone. It's not Ta-Nehisi Coates, just so people don't think about it. Nor is it it Lionel Francis U. But in the meantime, I would like to remind you, comics are for everyone, every day. This has been Contest of Challengers. I have been Patrick Brower. I've been W. Dublish. Thanks for listening. Keep reading comics. This has been Contest of Challengers. Thanks for listening. Keep reading comics. Challengers is located at 1845 Northwestern Avenue in the Bucktown neighborhood of Chicago. 773-278-0155. Keep up to date with new releases and events at challengerscomics.com. Like Challengers Comics on Facebook. Follow at Challengers on Twitter and help fund this podcast at patreon.com slash challengers.